Over to you, Nishit. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and our panelists. Um, Africa Health Business, in partnership with Asia Africa Investment and Consulting, welcome you to our fifth webinar, Leveraging Technology to Deliver Continuous Healthcare During COVID-19. I'm sure you're all familiar with the house rules on your screen. The Q&A will take place in the last 15 minutes of the 60 minute session, and we hope you thoroughly enjoy it. Over the past five years, Africa Health Business, through its annual Africa Health Business Symposium, AHBS, has facilitated dialogues to strengthen public-private partnerships for better health on the continent. We are happy to share a short clip of our journey as we prepare for our first webinar series. I'm very pleased to be part of this symposium today and my commitment uh, and the commitment of the African Union Commission is to continue this partnership and to make sure that more and more uh, representatives of the private sector will, will come on board. This is the second time I've been, I've been so two out of four, um, and it's just a really rich dialogue to bring together uh, public sector and ministers of health, uh, very senior level government officials. Being a part of this symposium is like being in class. As you have all seen, the clip highlights the five-year journey that we've had with high-level engagement to foster PPPs in Africa. We have carefully selected these five sessions, which prove to offer great opportunities for public-private partnerships in the health sector at the time of the pandemic. In addition to the five sessions that you see on the screen, we will have two high-level invite-only roundtable sessions on the 15th and 31st of July. So book your Fridays from 17th July to 14th August for these exemplary sessions. If you want to be part of these, there is an open invitation. We would love to hear from you on curating sessions or showcasing solutions. My name is Nishit Shah, Partnerships Director at Africa Health Business. My email and number are on the screen, so please feel free to reach out to me. For more information, please visit our website, africahealthbusiness.com and stay tuned for registration details. For today's session, in keeping, P in keeping with the PPP momentum and to lead us onto this webinar, I would like to invite our executive chairman and the session moderator, Dr. Amit Thakkar. Thank you, Nishit, for running us through what we've been through in the last five years. And you can see the PPP engagement is really at the center of what Africa Health Business is all about. Today, it's absolutely a delight for us to host three amazing companies in healthcare technologies in Africa that are not only working with the private sector, but also with the public sector to strengthen health systems from across um, the entire five regions. Uh, I am really delighted. I, will, I have panelists that have logged in from all parts of the world today 
These are healthcare leaders and specialists in investments, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves in turn. Let me first start and begin with Hiroki Ishida. Hiroki, over to you. Hello, everyone. I am Hiroki, the director of ARC Kenya. I relocated to Kenya from Japan in 2015, but currently I am in Japan uh, because of the pandemic and already I miss Kenya. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hiroki. Ife Lua Olokode, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ife Lua Olokode, and I'm the head of partnerships at Helium Health. I am dialing in from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you, Ife Lua. Kak Pema Yelpala, popularly known as KP, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is KP. I'm the founder and CEO of Access Mobile. Um, I founded Access Mobile in 2011, and We've been working primarily in East and Southern Africa and then also in the US. I'm coming to you live from Denver. From Denver. Thank you, KP. Uh, over to Caitlin Dolcott. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm the founder and managing director at Flare. Uh, we run an emergency response system here in Kenya. Thank you, Caitlin. And now, finally, to Shigeru Honda. Hi, everybody. My name is Shigeru Handa. I'm the director of AIC and joining from Singapore. Thank you. Thank you. You can see how diverse this panel is. It's one of the most diverse panels we've had in the business engagement for healthcare technology. So I'd like to really thank all of you for, for spending the time with us. And AIC, who has partnered with AHB, has been able to bring the three portfolio companies to tell us a little bit more about AIC. It's my pleasure to now invite Hiroki Ishida, uh, who is a director uh, based in Kenya, but right now based in Japan. Hiroki, welcome. Thank you, Amit. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for joining this webinar. I hope uh, we can provide information that is useful and relevant to your work under the current situation. I'd like to briefly explain about ARC. And ARC provides investment, consulting, and HR services and has offices in Asia and Africa. Uh, next slide, please. In Africa, we manage a fund that is focused on healthcare sector. The fund size is approximately 45 million US dollars. Uh, we believe that healthcare as well as education are fundamental factors of the human and economic development of a country. There's a vast pool of Japanese technology and knowledge that can be beneficially utilized in this continent. Next slide, please. Uh, this map shows the deal activity of Asian investors in Africa. Here, you can see our footprint across this continent. Next slide, please. So to date, we have 20 portfolio companies. We focus on three main pillars, uh, which we believe are complementary to each other. On the left is advanced medical care, such as hospitals, clinics, and spe specialized centers. At the center, the technology, such as telemedicine, AI diagnosis, and software services. And today's speakers fall under this category. Lastly, is the medical services and public health. Uh, we are particularly keen on technology, hence uh, this webinar. Nevertheless, conventional facilities are still essential because without them, technology is futile. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, uh, this slide shows the map of a company selected by IFC Tech Image Health East Africa. Highlighted are the logos of speakers today, so who you must be eager to hear from directly. Uh, that's it from me about ARC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hiroki. This gives us a nice segue into electronic medical records, patient engagement, and emergency in that order out of this entire circuit of uh, health technologies that are finalists in IFC. We are really delighted to invite Ifelua Olokode, who is the health, head of health partnerships 
at Helium Health. So, Ifeloa, over to you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you to all our participants for joining us. Um, yes, my name is Ifeoluwa and I'm the head of partnerships at Helium Health. And I'll just tell you a bit about our company and what we are doing to support um, healthcare providers and the government during this pandemic. Next slide, please. Okay. All right, so we're Helium Health and what we do is that we offer a suite of connected, connected solutions uh, that serve as digital infrastructure for powering healthcare in Af Africa. That's a mouthful, but basically we provide digital solutions for every stakeholder in the healthcare value chain, um, providers and patients, payers and public health partners. And I'm gonna to talk to you about how we are su supporting our providers and the government, which fall under, I guess, public health partners during this pandemic. Um, next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So more about us, our traction. We are the leading hosp hospital software provider in West Africa. We have over 400 in-network health facilities, over 5,000 medical prof professionals using our software to manage over 165 thousand patient visits each month and we have a footprint in three countries nigeria ghana and liberia um, we're also the government we're also the technology partner for uh, the government's covid19 response in uh, two states in nigeria the lagos um, lagos states and kano states which are the current epicenters of covid19 in nigeria so i'll just tell you more about what's going on with covid19 in nigeria so as of June 10, um, there were 13,000, over 13,000 confirmed cases, over 300 deaths, um, and just over 80,000, 82,000 tests. And that, that seems odd, doesn't it? Um, we are the third highest number of confirmed cases in Africa. And how COVID-19 is being managed right now is being managed by um, the federal government, by the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. It's overseen by that body, but the states, the individual states in Nigeria are responsible for taking action and managing the, the pandemic within their borders, right? So the NCDC provides kind of oversight and support, but the actual public health response is the responsibility of the state government. Um, um, so there are instances of suspected COVID-19 um, patients going to private health facilities for treatment. So they may be sick and not really knowing why they're ill, but like, you know, they're actually supposed to go to, to the government. They're supposed to call a hotline if they suspect that they're sick and they're supposed, to, the, the government is supposed to take it up from there. Um, the realities of the current response is that there are significant delays and errors in case reporting, testing and treatment. Um, the coordination of COVID-19 response has been largely analog. And because of that, there have been, you know, some errors and just delays and it's, it, it's not been, you know, it's basically been lagging behind our, our peers like Ghana. Um, there have been hundreds of mysterious deaths um, in, for example, in Kano, there are stories of hundreds of people dying mysteriously that, you know, suspected to be COVID cases. Um, state of emergency was declared in Kano state. Um, and there are several instances of private hospital closures where, you know, when people come in sick because there's kind of no process to triage or evaluate, people come in with COVID and the hospitals have to shut down. And there has been a steep decline in hospital visits. So that affects how, you know, that affects revenue, for example. So key stats I want to point out is that um, Nigeria currently only tests about one, there's about one test per um, 100,000 people. That's you know, that's a low scale of testing. Um, then this pandemic has had such a drastic effect on the revenue of, of health, of private health facilities in, in, in particular. So what we've done, you know, when the pandemic kind of, when it became, when it got declared a pandemic and we envisioned kind of the, the challenges our partners could have, we decided that, okay, we can help our hospitals in our network by creating a telemedicine platform for them to 
you know, keep earning revenue, keep in touch with their, keep offering consultations with their patients in a safe manner. So we, we always had this in our roadmap, but we just accelerated the timeline of this development so that our health facilities can, you know, at least earn some revenue. Because like I mentioned, there have been closures, you know, there were closures of hospitals and people just generally afraid to leave their houses. And because there's a pandemic, that doesn't mean like people stop needing care. You know, there are people who have chronic conditions, there are people who, you know, who need to see their doctors. So we, we made it a point to make that possible. And, you know, beyond just offering consultations, we also wanted them to earn revenue from this consultations because some of them were kind of, you know, already doing it with WhatsApp or, you know, with Zoom, but that means that, you know, they can't, managing it is more difficult when you use those, those channels. So we decided to create a specific um, telemedicine platform and it's so easy. It can be installed in less than 10 minutes for providers. Um, it allows them kind of, you know, send, links to join the telemedicine for patients to join the, the call and um, patients don't need to install any new apps. They just click the link and join, join the telemedicine appointment and they're able to also pay for the appointment beforehand. So that's like the telemedicine solution, uh, the solution we came up with for the private sector. And within a few days, maybe like a week, we had over a hundred out of network um, private health facilities express interest in using this platform. So it was so popular and so very much needed. Um, we could go to the next slide, please. Then for the public sector, um, like I mentioned, kind of, you know, gaps in the response, right? Mostly analog, um, people will call a hotline you know, if they suspected COVID and basically how those people get passed along the different pillars of the public health response was analog and was kind of, it was disorganized. Um, people fell through the cracks. There were cases of people waiting, you know, to get picked up from their houses to be taken to the isolation center for like hours or people waiting in the vans for hours to get tested. Um, and we realized that, you know, look, technology can make this so much more efficient. And we partnered with um, the Lagos state government. We created an emergency response system and you know, customized it for, that's customizable for each different workflow, public health response workflow of each um, state government. So it manages every aspect from you know, the initial intake to you know, sending uh, samples to the labs to um, monitoring kind of the epidemiology curve um, yeah, and this solution facilitates the quicker execution of all of the response activities. It provides visibility into like the performance of each pillar. So how is the call center doing? How are we doing with picking up labs, lab samples? What's the delay? What's the lag? Um, and it also enables the public health authorities um, make data-driven resource allocation decisions. So like they know, okay, we, this, this pillar is falling behind on our, of our expectations. We need to reinvest, um, you know, manpower and get more people. So that's what our public health emergency response system does. Um, next slide, please. So post COVID future, um, you know, of course the, the effects of this pandemic are devast devastating um, and they're really shaking the entire, it's, it's really shaking the entire world up. We think that it is an opportunity for a reset, right? Um, technology is our best chance, is Africa's best chance at producing the speed and agility required to contain disease outbreaks. So we really need to invest more in technology and connecting, sorry, can you go back? Um, in, in invest more in technology and connecting all of the pillars of, of healthcare with technology and um, use this as an opportunity to, you know, collaborate with other people and um, other Tech, uh, healthcare stakeholders and, and see how we can reinvent um, how healthcare is currently done and what we could do to enhance it. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ifelua. That was really um, a good comprehensive overview. One of the points was the delays and errors that you talked about and many of us based in different parts of Africa are concerned about that. And we are on the early days and COVID-19 is young in Africa. And I'm sure 
platforms like yours would be very, very um, useful to optimize in what you're doing. So well done. It's my pleasure now to take you to patient engagement. And for patient engagement, I'd like to invite KP uh, all the way from Colorado, Denver, who's logged in from, for Excess Mobile to take us through his presentation. Over to you, KP. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing um, specifically in patient engagement and COVID response um, in different African countries. Um, and there are a few lessons I'd, I'd like to share. Um, so what do we do? So Access Mobile is a company that is focused on improving access to health information and services through mobile engagement. We're a global business that started in East Africa. We've expanded to Southern Africa and also work in the US. Um, what we've observed, and, and particularly looking at the African market, is text messaging, for example, or mobile communication is nothing new. Um, but our, our goal is to partner with both the public and private sector to ensure that communication to patients and communities is both personalized and relevant um, to, to individuals' needs. Next slide, please. Um, so our, our model involves um, a number of different elements. From a technological perspective, um, we have a high-scale interactive messaging service that's been used to message millions of people globally in an interactive way, primarily through text messaging, um, but now expanding to other mobile channels that people use regularly, such as WhatsApp. Um, also, if you guys are familiar with Google RCS, Basically, that's the equivalent of iMessage on Android um, and, and, and increasingly also looking at chatbots. So all the chatbot really is, is an automated way to facilitate interactive communication. Um, but our goal is ultimately to influence behavior. So what we've observed with messaging is that oftentimes in the healthcare space in African countries, providers send texts um, that are quite generalized. Um, and if you look at the COVID context, people need very specific information about what to do and what actions to take. Um, next slide. Um, so there are a few elements um, of what we've been doing with regards to COVID, um, ultimately to ensure that people have timely um, and localized information around their healthcare needs. And also it's a specific emphasis on populations that are at risk. Um, so, you know, the, you know, I'll talk a bit about a couple case studies, but, you know, we've been working in South Africa, for example, with uh, our partner Broadreach on the APACE initiative. And so you can imagine that for people um, accessing HIV um, or TB treatment, um, that the lockdown that happened in South Africa was quite a disruption, not just for that whole economy, but for people with chronic care needs. Um, and, and those people also are people that are at particular risk for COVID. And so there's kind of a double um, edged um, importance in reaching those people and ensuring that we can support them. Um, our, our, our implementations have, have been around um, specifically SMS COVID communications. I can say um, when COVID happened, all of our providers started reaching out to us and saying, KP, we, people are at home. We need a quick and high scale way to reach people with information. And our messaging increased by 10x from pre-COVID to during COVID on the basis of that need. Um, what I've observed in terms of information for people is the following. Um, when COVID first happened, as many of you will know, the WHO launched a very large scale initiative to support getting relevant information out at global scale with, with WhatsApp and Facebook. Then there's a second phase of communication that started to happen with governments in African countries, specifically partnering with telecom communications to start to send mass scale messaging. Now, these were clearly two things that needed to happen um, for those stakeholders to ensure that accurate information was getting out to people at scale. But the other element that's of critical importance is that everything around response to COVID at a patient level is local. And so what, what needs to happen is increasingly localized and personalized communication so that people know what to do. Um, we'll talk more about that in the next slide. Next slide, please. 
Um, so as I mentioned, we partner with Broadreach Healthcare in South Africa. Um, we are a partner on the APACE initiative, which is um, PEPFAR's program to support the South African government's um, efforts around HIV epidemic control. Um, that initiative, we're responsible for both KZN and Pumalanga provinces. It's over 300 sites. It's several hundreds of thousands of people that are at some stage of the cascade of care. Um, what happened when, when, when we had the lockdown in South Africa is a significant disruption for people seeking HIV treatment. And as you can imagine, patient volumes at all facilities um, associated with HIV care and treatment reduced exponentially. Um, back, please. Can you go back one slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so that drop in patient volumes became a major concern. And so what happened is the, the government of South Africa, and specifically the provincial governments, gave us an exemption, specifically KZN province, to start to message people at scale. But these were the types of issues. I'm going to give a couple examples, very practical issues that became challenges. So for example, during a lockdown, if someone has HIV treatment, they don't know whether or not they're allowed to go to the facility. So many people were confused about whether if they had HIV care needs and scheduled appointments, whether they could actually go to those appointments. So we had to do messaging around that. Um, some people did not know that when they went for treatment, they needed to have a mask at the facility. That was the national protocol for reasons we could understand. So then imagine you're an HIV patient going for care, you take the time out of your day to go to the facility, and then you don't have a mask and you get turned away, okay? These are just a very practical localized kind of experiences of patients. We also have heard anecdotes that um, patients would actually use text messages that were sent through our system to prove to the authorities during lockdown that they could be out of their house because they had to actually leave to go to get treatment during the lockdown. Um, so these are just some personal case studies from people on the ground of, of how messaging that's, that's relevant and personalized impacts people in a COVID context. Um, we're also partnering with Emory and Africa's Talking around a disease surveillance and linkage to care initiative. Um, Emory School of Medicine with some other partners has developed a tool called C19 Check. It is a symptom checker that's quite robust based on global standards and is actually being used at scale internationally. Um, it was also used during the SARS epidemic. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the challenge they had is that it was a web-based tool. So they approached us and Africa's Talking, which is our telecom partner, and said, KP, how can we adapt this internet-based tool for the African context for populations that typically don't have internet access? And so what we've done is we're finalizing an adaptation of the C19 check tool into USSD. Um, one thing we observe with symptom checkers is that there needs to be a call to action. I mean, in our view, a symptom checker that tells you that you're COVID positive, but, what the but doesn't tell you what the next step is, doesn't go the whole way. And so in this model, we are actually linking disease surveillance and symptom checking with localized communication. So if someone goes through the symptom checker and they find out that they could be COVID positive, that they then get a specific communication about what to do in their locale. And lastly, we're gonna be launching, a, we just found out this week, we're launching a new initiative in Southern Africa and four countries um, with regards to youth and HIV and school-based um, health education interventions. And with COVID now, there becomes an increasing need to reach people through mobile who aren't in school settings or other environments. Next slide, yeah. please. So three areas of focus that, that, that we see in, in this COVID-19 context. So the one issue is about return back to care. This is a big one. Um, this impacts both the public and the private sector. Um, what's happening that many of you will be aware of is kind of two things. One, for people that have regular care needs, many of them still don't have specific information about their personal care needs and what to do. Um, also, people are uncertain or even afraid of going to the facility thinking that they might be putting themselves at risk for COVID. And so generally the feedback is both in the public and private sector, there's been significant reductions in volumes of patients 
particularly for people with uh, regular care needs. So there's a critical importance to personalize communication to help inform people about what to do about their specific care needs, or else we're going to see an increasing burden of not just COVID, but all the other chronic care needs that people have and, and adverse health outcomes. Um, we are starting to complement telehealth services. So because telehealth has been expanding, patient engagement becomes a complementary tool to help communicate to people what telehealth services are available to them and also to support remote diagnostics. And there clearly needs to be a, a focus, a continued focus on vulnerable populations, namely the elderly, frontline workers, people with chronic disease and comorbidities who are at particular risk. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, um, KP. That was really, really succinct, talking about patient engagement. And one thing specific that you touched on for many of us who are dealing with this in Africa is the vulnerable population. And the case fatality rate, as you know, for the vulnerable population is extremely high. One part of the positive point for us is the median age in Africa. And when you talked about youth and reaching out to the youth, it's absolutely vital. And um, they're truly impressive about the engagement you have with patient, but also what you're doing in COVID. So from USA, thank you, KP, for that. Let's move um, to Kenya, where we invite Caitlin Dolcott, who's been doing some very exciting work in emergency. Just to mention one of them that we know is the Wheels for Life to help mothers during curfew time, but many more initiatives that she's taken on for emergency care. Caitlin, over to you. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. So my name is Caitlin. I am a founder at Flair, um, based in Nairobi. And today we operate the largest network of ambulances throughout the country. So next slide, please. So when we started uh, in Nairobi, uh, it used to take about three hours to get an ambulance. Um, so for those of you that are coming from around the world, there was no you know, single number to call upon. There was no functioning 911, 999, 112, you know, whatever the three digit number is in you know, perhaps the country that you're calling in from, that didn't exist. Um, well, there was a number, oftentimes that number was not picked up. And if the number was picked up, there wasn't an actual ambulance at the other end of that line. This situation is actually the reality for 95% of the African continent. Um, and nearly two thirds of the world, where it is oftentimes the exception that a country or a city has 911 services. Um, and, you know, beyond the lack of kind of a centralized service, also ambulances uh, tend to be run by private providers, so incredibly expensive for the majority of the population. Um, and so fast forward to, to where we are today is that using technology, Similar to Uber, we were able to bring together all of the existing ambulances uh, throughout the country to be able to create a citywide, nationwide emergency response system. And only through those partnerships were we able to, in a very short period of time and for pretty insubstantial you know, resources, uh, construct you know, a modern day 911 at a fraction of the cost and that is far more efficient. Um, we offer the product through a microinsurance so that patients don't have to pay at the point of emergency. Um, that's the last thing that you would ever want to do is that you're having a heart attack and someone's trying to get money from you um, to pay for an ambulance. And so we offer a microinsurance product to be able to scale that access. Next slide. And so here you can see that, you know, after three months of working with one of our you know, corporate partners, we were able to bring the response down substantially. Um, today in Nairobi, our average response time is 15 minutes. That's on par with global cities like London um, or even New York, where as fast as two, three, four minutes for uh, priority cases, meaning the kind of most uh, serious, most life-threatening um, incidents. Uh, and that's really done through kind of the partnerships that I mentioned by bringing all the ambulances together across the country, uh, as well as through you know, our technology and our dispatch center. So speaking about COVID in Kenya, um, emergency responders 
uh, play a key role in the COVID response. Um, so we are at the front lines of this response in Kenya. Um, ambulances are responsible for transporting suspected or confirmed patients from their home to a hospital, moving patients between facilities. So perhaps you've tested positive at a facility and now need to go to an isolation facility, or you need to go to a more advanced facility for care. So in every country, ambulances are a key um, link and uh, part of this whole response. And so for us, uh, given that, you know, we have hundreds of ambulances, you know, located throughout the country, that also translates to thousands of EMTs, nurses, paramedics that are in the back of the ambulance. These individuals are actually one of the highest risk profile in the healthcare system. And so our immediate kind of call to action was to say, we need to protect them. They must have the correct PPE. Otherwise, you know, it's totally irresponsible to be sending them out to suspected uh, patients. Um, Kenya, like many other countries, you know, it was difficult to get, you know, PPE uh, initially. And so one of the things that we ensured that we did was that all of them have the correct PPE and that they were able to buy in bulk. Um, so we have uh, trained all of our kind of hundreds of EMTs in Nairobi, as well as throughout the country, provided them PPE uh, and um, done several dozen COVID patients um, in Nairobi. The second kind of initiative uh, that I wanted to talk about was what um, Amit mentioned, is that one of the kind of early realizations that we had and are really proud to be a partner with KHF as well as you know, Bolt and uh, a number of other partners on this is that emergencies don't stop just because COVID is happening. And, I, and that's been mentioned already, you know, during this teleconference is that, you know, people will continue to have heart attacks. There will continue to be road accidents. There will continue to be stroke patients or chronic conditions. And one of the kind of uh, biggest areas that we realized that was going to be underserved was mothers is that in Nairobi, uh, they put in place a curfew, which makes sense um, for many reasons to curb the spread of COVID. Um, but that also meant that, you know, during the evening hours, you were unable to leave your house, um, even to get to the hospital. And so that left, you know, in Nairobi alone, more than 150 women give birth in Nairobi, 2,500 women across the country every single day. Um, so for the last 45 days, that's 100,000 births, you know, are in jeopardy of not actually getting to a health facility. And when you don't get to a health facility, uh, mortality rises. If you just go back one sec. Thank you. Uh, so over the last 45 days, through this consortium of partners coming together, we've responded to over 5,000 calls, uh, provided life-saving trips um, for women, and have had a 100% survival rate. Um, which is amazing. So every single woman that we have, uh, you know, been able to save, whether some of them even give birth in the back of the ambulance, a lot of births at home, because they call you a little bit too late. Uh, but yeah, we're really, yeah, excited and proud to be part of this. And then the last slide. And so I know that there's an incredibly diverse kind of group of, of individuals on this call, but I think there's two ways that like we would love to connect with you, you know, afterwards is that one, if you are a hospital or a clinic or you're a healthcare provider that has an ambulance um, is to reach out to us such that we can get you on the network and you can now become part of this nationwide system. And then I think the other is just that one of the things that I think COVID has really taught us is like, um, it is, you know, necessary to prepare and have a plan of preparation. And I think one of the things that we do with that is that, you know, we offer um, rescue to individuals, to corporates, to ensure that they, you know, when an emergency happens, they know exactly who to call and, and they're covered. So for either of those, please reach out to me afterwards and happy to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And you're absolutely right that the 150 odd participants on this call are so diverse on all parts and all segments of healthcare. And what we've heard from the emergency side, uh, as well as the patient engagement side and EMR and contact tracing side are all aspects that are very, very useful in healthcare technologies. So thank you so much uh, to all three of you on um, 
the information that you've provided us, also your contact information that you've provided us. We will be sharing this, this data with all the participants who've logged in. Um, this is a good time to invite Shigeru Honda all the way from Singapore to give an overview of what you feel the companies have shared with us in, in purpose of the healthcare technologies and its impact to Africa. Shigeru, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amit. And uh, thank you very much for the, uh, you know, participating this seminar. And uh, thank you very much to all the uh, panelists. And we are very glad to showcase uh, these uh, innovative uh, companies. And uh, uh, we, AIC have invested uh, about 20 uh, companies in Africa. And some are seriously affected by the uh, COVID, for example, by the uh, 60 or 70% of revenue reductions. And they are now focusing on the uh, capital preservation. That's part of the uh, uh, portfolio. But today uh, we um, had an opportunity to introduce uh, those uh, innovative uh, companies. And um, we continue to support the uh, companies and we are actively uh, looking for the opportunity for the uh, investment in the uh, healthcare sector. We, based on the three um, discussion, I just would like to highlight the uh, three uh, points. One mm -hmm. is the, uh, as the topic is clear, uh, digital innovation um, through especially mobile in Africa. So, so that to be a um, service can be more specific, customized as KP mentioned to reach more uh, individuals or to those who are in need of these services as also like mothers. So the bringing the uh, mass information to the uh, more customized, localized and uh, the digital health is bringing the, uh, let's say uh, healthcare services to the people's hand. That's uh, I think uh, one important aspect of the moving forward. And second one is the uh, speed. Uh, speed to overcome errors and uh, delays and errors, and also to bring the uh, um, revenue streams. As if I mentioned that you know they have accelerated the um, telemedicine uh, services and also bring in the uh, revenue streams. So speed is also a key. And the, the th last one is the uh, concerted and the collective uh, efforts uh, through digital um, innovation, moving from uh, analog. And the Wheels for Life is a great example as a public-private uh, partnership. And coordination is not always easy, but uh, you know they have Katni has really achieved, and to make sure that this collaboration works, and maybe um, we can discuss later how we can replicate this kind of success to the other countries. Replication is also uh, probably an important aspect the, uh, of the innovation. So um, having said those, uh, this COVID uh, situation makes us really think, rethink what we do and who we are. And uh, I think staying focused by um, reinforcing our core competency as all three did, does, uh, is very key uh, during this uh, challenging um, period. And you all have the uh, spiritual resilience and we uh, really appreciate that. And let me start uh, from here because uh, we have uh, quite many questions. So uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Amit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shigeru. This, um, you've touched on some very interesting points. One point that I'd like to pick up is taking health in your hands. And COVID has taught us many things. One thing it's taught us is that healthcare starts at the homestead. And as people are washing their hands, practicing, um, social distancing and better hygiene measures, we are beginning to see reduction in the health burden, especially of infective disease. And coupled with that, if we bring technology, I think we can multiply the effects of reducing the health burden into the facilities and maybe we can have better health spend. So there are some very positive things that are happening because of the pandemic. And I think the technology overlay we've heard will help a lot. Having talked about healthcare technologies on behalf of AHB, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank the finalists uh, on the Take Emerge Health East Africa from over 400 companies that applied 
all the three companies that are present here today are actually in the finalist list. I wish you all the best. We wish you a great journey. It's not only about being a finalist, but the impact you're making is incredible. So congratulations and, and thank you so much. Um, those of you who joined a little bit late and did not get a chance to review what we are doing from 17th July to 14th August, um, these are the five key opportunities that we have been discussing with the Ministry of Health. And these opportunities also were discussed with WHO. And there are clear areas where we believe private sector can play a role, not only in impacting the health of the African health system, but we also believe that there's a business case. And because it's a business case, we've termed this as the Africa Health Business Symposium webinar series. The five that you see taking place on Fridays are on the dates that are specified. But in addition, we will have two high-level roundtables. We will talk about tendering. We will talk about resource mobilization. We will talk about how the LPOs are issued for test kits. Uh, we will talk about what it means to partner with universities for contact tracing, whether it is the CDC or whether it's ministries of health. Who pays? How do you get paid? And where can you make an impact for the services in these institutional partners? So if you have time, uh, feel free to uh, join us on these um, interesting models that we have. We have institutional partners that you're all aware of that are at the bottom. And the journey of our in-person where we've communicated with different businesses and promoted these business interests across Africa is now moving from an in-person conference to the webinar series, the first one of its kind. Uh, we will move straight into the Q&A session. We have two sets of Q&A. And the first set of Q&A is what I will now share on your screen. Uh, that these were questions that we received in advance with some of the participants who've logged in. Um, and these seven questions, we will just skip them through and uh, go through them very quickly. And then uh, we will see which new questions have come through. So over to KP on the question number one on how are health workers motivated to adopt technology when everyone is running alone in the adoption of technology. KP, over to you. Yeah, so I think that's an important question. So um, let me frame that as pre-COVID and then COVID context. So in the pre-COVID context, what we know is um, that several innovations are being used um, by healthcare workers and others to try to support patient care and, and other things, particularly around community health volunteers, but also in the clinical context. Um, I think a lot of the focus pre-COVID was on uh, supporting clarity around regulation, um, around interoperability, so making sure that data can be shared, um, which is really helps healthcare workers or else um, information is disparate or, or they have to do a lot of double entry of work. I think that um, in a COVID context, and this looks different in different countries, but ultimately um, with any adoption of technology, you have to be solving someone's problems. So um, in our context with um, COVID work, um, in certain scenarios, um, health workers or others working within the health ecosystem became overwhelmed with certain tasks. Um, for example, um, lots of people calling facilities trying to understand what to do or whatever it may be. Um, so I think generally speaking, governments in COVID tried to take control of the situation in a very right. top-down approach, which we understand from the perspective of the government and the ministry. However, as I mentioned earlier, ultimately the response is local. Right. And so lots of individual facilities um, and, and, and health workers were trying to respond to their patient population and all the demands. And so I think it's that intersection where mm -hmm. you have to move with speed mm -hmm. and all the health workers' problems, let's say to help them with communication or whatever it may be, is where you drive adoption. Um, and at least that's been our observation. Absolutely. And I know all the, the academia who've logged in are listening to you and, and hearing that the fear of technology for health workers must be dropped down. So just the love for stethoscope. And now you need to understand how to use your mobile phone, 
how to use your laptop and how to communicate with patients. I think mm -hmm. we are seeing a new normal for health worker and patient engagement for technology. That's right. I agree. That's uh, exactly on point. Um, Caitlin, there's a question for you on the challenges and how to scale a business in sub-Saharan Africa. Many people will be very eager to hear your answer on how they overcome. Over to you. Thank you. Well, this definitely deserves a whole webinar in itself, but I will uh, shortly answer the question. I think in general, you know, scaling a business is hard, like whether you're in Europe, whether you're in, you know, Japan, whether you're in the US and you have to get the team right, you've got to get the product right, you have to have the financing, like that. this is not easy anywhere. I would say if we're looking kind of back here in Kenya, where we're based and looking at our kind of broader market of Africa, and specific to healthcare, I think one of the kind of challenges that we see that might be different in some of the other countries is fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And that you may have, which is what we saw in emergency response, you may have hundreds of ambulances, but the average fleet was one, meaning that on average, you owned one ambulance, which isn't really a fleet, that's just an ambulance. Um, and so what that means as it relates to scaling is that you have, you know, individual, you know, one by one by one. And so scaling isn't about, you know, getting a major hospital chain on board with hundreds of ambulances. Uh, and so that does mean that it takes a little bit more time as it relates to kind of piecing the system together. I think, though, that kind of the flip side of that is that it means that there's a blank slate, is we're not dealing with incumbents, we're not dealing with people that are so big that they can muscle you out of the market. And so as a result, I think actually, you know, in a way that it is a challenge, it actually it helps us kind of build from the, the ground up a better solution um, for this market. Great. Just one question on that, Caitlin. If you were not based here and you were based in another country like uh, the Sumitomo Corporation in Japan or in Canada, how difficult is it to do business in sub-Saharan Africa while not being in sub-Saharan Africa? I'm, What's your personal experience? Yeah, I, I think it, it probably really depends on the business <clears throat> that you run. But for us, emergency response, it, it's not, it would be impossible. We literally are a 24-7 operation um, dealing with emergencies, time is of the essence and understanding the systems and, you know, how t it all can come together is so important to be kind of here. So I think for our particular business, no yeah. way. Um, and, but I, I guess it really depends on like what business you're building. Yes, of course. Okay. Let me turn it over to, um, Helium Health and, um, how can we scale up the use of telemedicine? I mean, you do a lot of if you are, you've talked about telemedicine a lot. You have a lot of work on, as a tech partner. Um, how, how do we increase access to health using telemedicine? And how do we get governments to literally invest in this? Tough question, over to you. Yeah, um, so we've, during this period, we've really been doing a lot of thinking and reimagining. And one of the things that we've, found out from, from this pandemic and engaging with providers is that, and, and the ones that have adopted our telemedicine solution is that, you know, they love the convenience, they love how um, flexible it is, um, but the sticking point for them is, you know, getting paid. So a lot of them, you know, working with health insurance companies and getting paid for telemedicine, um, for the telemedicine services. And, they, there's kind of this clash between traditional healthcare providers and HMOs where, you know, the traditional healthcare providers are like, oh, like, you know, even though it's a telemedicine consultation, it's still a consultation, you should pay me the like regular rate and the HMOs are like, no, it shouldn't cost the same. So there's this clash and there are, you know, standalone telemedicine providers coming up and kind of you know snapping up the market and you know what i want to what i want to emphasize uh, and speaking to, to providers and payers is that there has to be you know a middle ground and a collaboration um we still need physical traditional healthcare providers there are some things that you cannot do via telemedicine right and but we need them to kind of stay alive right we need them to yeah. to 
their life to provide these big services. So there has to be a middle ground and um, what we've been trying to kind of drive and, and change the mindset with providers and HMOs is that like, you are in bed together forever, you need each other. So there has to be um, some compromise. You have to both kind of shift your thinking. Traditional providers, you have to shift your thinking and say, okay, te this is what telemedicine allows me to do. I can see, you know, 5X more patients in this, in this you know, kind of my, my typical work day. That means that maybe I could shave some cost off the consultation, right? And, you know, I'll, I'll still make my money, whether you're making, whether, you know, if you're making $1 million in like, you know, hundred dollar chunks versus 50 is still money you know still the same money and yeah so kind of re that re-education um and for hmos to also kind of don't not to cut off their nose despite their faces like you need them to provide these big you know um this big procedures so uh yeah so that's kind of the reorientation that in terms of um governments getting governments to invest in this also shifting mindsets in terms of, look, you have all of these, you know, for, I'll, I'll take a state in Nigeria, you have this healthcare budget, you want to do, you know, 100 new primary healthcare centers. But traditionally, after a few, like, there's, there's, realistically, you could maybe do half of that in your tenure, right? And, um, you know, after a while, they become dilapidated, they're underutilized, people, you know, doctors don't want to like move to remote areas. How do you rethink primary care with telemedicine? How about like a telemedicine kiosk, for example, um, combined with task shifting where you have, you know, um, nurses and lab techs, you know, it is it, 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 it centralized a centralized and decentralized diagnostic um, mechanism where, you know, you have your telemedicine kiosk and you have people, you know, um, samples being picked up from these kiosks. This way you, every one of your citizens has access to great health care. Um, doctors can speak to anyone within the state, no matter where their location is. And um, you're still, you know, you're saving costs. So, um, kind of helping government see that, look, with this amount of money, this is so much more that you can do. This is how you can do it. This is how technology can help you um, achieve all of this. Um, yeah, so I, I, think it's a, I think it's a very exciting time. Think, and Like um, you've said, show, showing them the value, you know, mm -hmm. it's really the value offering that this will bring. Yes. Let me move on to Osman. Thank you, Osman. Um, it's specifically one of the reasons why we've organized the high level roundtable and the digital health seminar on 17th July on how the weak health systems can partner with so many innovative companies like the ones we have here today and others. There will be funders. One of the biggest things is the funding. So the immediate funding needs in many countries was around PPEs, gloves, uh, masks, uh, protective equipment, and now we are going in a phase where you will be able to fund applications or solutions that will keep the curve flat. So it's a great question, not easy, but we will cover it on 17th uh, July. Access Mobile, I'll go to KP. Oh, very briefly, how can we sustain innovative technology in the health sector from AMREF International University? Right, so I think there's three elements to this. So the first is you need um, innovators that are looking to solve problems and the African continent has no shortage of that. Um, the next element I talk about is technology. Um, on the element of the technology and the enablers first, I think that the adoption of cloud um, specifically is key. Um, because that cloud infrastructure and specifically the digital transformation of data, it's the foundation on which most innovations are going to sit. And right now, I think various African countries are in different stages with regards to the public and private sector in terms of setting up those foundational systems of data and health information management that enable innovators to build on top of that. Um, I would say that also with that comes data regulation and then um, sustainability ultimately links to the business model. 
Um, as we all know, there's many, many pilots, particularly in the public sector. Um, and I think um, what needs to happen is as we get the foundational assets in place, the business models will be able to follow through scale. Um, lastly, I'll say that um, what groups are often looking for is a whole solution, right? right. And oftentimes you'll hear yeah. from the purchaser, I don't wanna buy 10 solutions, I want one. But then from the innovator's view, they need to take a narrow problem and solve it completely. And that creates an inherent friction. So more partnerships between technology groups that have complementary innovations will allow those partners to more holistically meet the, needs of the groups that are looking for innovations. Excellent. Thanks, KP, for that. Caitlin, very briefly, um, challenges when it comes to customer service support for medical technology. You do that all the time. Um, <laughs> how do you manage? What are the biggest needs? Yeah, I would say I would flip this question around is why do you need customer service if your product works? And so actually focus on testing your product, validating your product and making uh -huh. it simple and easy to use um, because customer sh support should not be a major component if you have a software or technology company. You should actually make sure the product works first and foremost. Spot on, spot on. Um, let's go to Helium Health. Um, uh, if Elua, biggest challenge for health tech organizations in Africa. It's a whole webinar again by itself. <laughs> but I think the word there is biggest from Ruben. Christian Ruben is asking you. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest would be kind of the education and like opening people's eyes to the possibilities and just like reorienting people to, to what is possible. Um, so right now our core solution is our electronic medical record solution and our biggest competitor is paper right um so it's you know and as caitlin alluded to fragmentation is a big problem so there are a lot of like small you know clinics and hospitals people that don't think that oh technology is for them or they're managing just fine without technology so it's opening the eyes of those kinds of you know providers and saying look you know this is so this is what you could be if you had technology we will you know provide you with flexibility to try it out we will you know so i think yeah going back to the question the the biggest is kind of education educating your market and and showing people the possibilities yeah right we are running uh, a little bit behind time we will take about five more minutes. If Liz, if you can share the screen, we've got some live questions. And these questions are coming in from different audiences. Uh, one of them is directed directly to you, Ifelua, uh, to Helium Health. And the first one is just confirm if the application is web-based and what is the cost? Is it an annual renewal or do we have a trial version in brief? Okay, all right, so it is, cloud and on-premise. So you have the option of using the cloud version or using um, a server. And we have a flexible pricing model. So um, our, our, our solution has different components and modules and depending right. on what your facilities needs are, um, the price right. varies, but we have like a, you know, a per patient pricing model for smaller healthcare facilities and like, you know, software licenses for bigger facilities. So I'd be happy to chat more about this after yeah. the webinar. Um, KP, on, um, on Broadreach partnership that you have, you've got Swedish health startup coming in from Monica. Um, one day Broadreach is looking for partnering with telemedicine companies. Maybe a Broadreach question, but do you want to make just two words about that? Yeah, I think I'd just say that that's really looking at what this, how the South African government wants to move with regards to telehealth. And I think that clearly with the COVID response that is happening um, and all of us as partners are, are looking to support those goals. So I, I would anticipate that, you know, in the because we're in year two of five with that initiative that I assume um, telehealth is going to be increasingly a model. Right, I totally agree. And I think Joki Karyuki has asked a question that KP talked about of scale up and sustainability on the three points. And I think it's pretty much in line with that. Lawrence is asking uh, brilliant activities for different parts of the pandemic, but there is there any thoughts on joining the dots, bringing all these activities in a single source of truth, such as service directories to be accessed by stakeholders 
And that's something that maybe Nishit, you can talk to because you're working on trying to bring joining the dots. You talked about Smart Africa. You, you've been talking about Connected Health Africa. What are you trying to do? Can you bring everyone together because there could be some synergy? Two words on that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Amit. So I think from our perspective, we have been you know, uh, engaging with the different stakeholders in the entire ecosystem um, from the African continent to understand how this joining of the dots can happen. Um, in particular reference to COVID-19, um, we, we have created a, a sort of platform which is called the Africa Response to COVID-19, which specifically engages with the stakeholders to know the sort of solutions they're providing, um, you know, going down into the lessons learned and, uh, you know, in which countries these models have worked and how they can be replicated. Um, at the same time, it's also, you know, to, to kind of get all the digital players into uh, one bucket and say, how do we integrate the systems um, to join the, the same dots um, that uh, Lori is uh, asking about? Sure. sure. Thank you. KP, um, you saw the next question. I'm sure you've read it. <laughs> Omni-channel service, then multi-channel means where digital and physical means operate in silos. Right. So I think um, what I, the way I want to respond to that is, and, and for people that maybe want to understand the nuance there, um, omni-channel um, communication tries to um, harmonize um, to create a simple and seamless process around how people receive information instead of getting hit from many places. I think the, my response to that is as follows. All we care about is reaching people through the channel that matters to them. So if you prefer texting, we send you an SMS. If you prefer WhatsApp, we send you a WhatsApp message. If it's Google RCS, it's that. So I think meeting people where they are with their preferred channel is really the focus. With regards to consolidation of information, it's absolutely in key. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where you have to partner with the governments and with the other stakeholders to ensure that your communication is on behalf of the partners it isn't in com conflict with other information. So that is key. Right. The next question is interesting. I don't have data. KP, Caitlin, or uh, Ifilua, do you know? I know that telemedicine penetration has increased in the pandemic. There's no doubt. I think we are at early stages. I wouldn't say whether 10% income has gone up or we've seen more providers. But mushroom, mushrooming of many telemedical providers has, has come up. There's been fast tracking of regulation. So like in Kenya, we're under the Health Act. Uh, we've now finally got a whole model of how to license telemedicine providers. Um, I'm sure in the next six months, we will be able to see a lot more data coming up. But any one of you, KP, any data on this? Um, on this one, I, I think there's not much, um, there's not much um, concrete data, but I think the trends show that uh, in terms of the directionality, everything is moving um, towards that space. But I'm curious about what some of the other panelists might be seeing in terms yeah. of actual data. Adrian, yeah. you, want to, you want to say what you think this might be looking like right now? No, I'm, I'm super curious to know. I guess like I, I agree that it's likely increased. I mean, I think that telemedicine conceptually has always made sense, you know, for markets like Kenya and Africa, but has been hard to uh, increase the uptake. So I think that COVID was the right kind of move to make it you know, higher adoption. So I'm curious to see what the results are. The COVID has nudged it along. If Lua, you want to attempt to answer? Sure. Um, yeah, like KP, I, we don't have kind of, you know, comprehensive, decisive data, but what I would say is that the telemedicine, um, even though the lockdown has ended in, in um, Nigeria and now there's a curfew, there's still telemedicine appointments going on. So for some facilities, um, they've held steady um, where people kind of have adopted and they're like, okay, if I don't actually need to go to the hospital, if I can get the care I need via this means, why not just keep getting it? But they're like other hospitals in different parts of the of town who are like, no, I want to see my doctor. So I think we'll see kind of ebbs and flows and kind of, you know, as, as there's more data, we'll, we'll understand people's motivations for um, choosing telemedicine or not. Thank you for that question. Really interesting. Thank you. The last question is from Dr. Uma Nambiar from India. 
thank you for joining us. Um, do, you, do you see any decrease in deployment of remote diagnostic or intervention devices? Uh, are there any legal guidelines to address the issues of consent, stroke payment of e-prescription in telemedicine? So if Elua, maybe you could try that. What do you think? Are there guidelines? Um, so honestly, it's kind of the wild west <laughs> right now. Um, I think everybody is learning as we go along, including the, the policymakers and regulators. And um, that's why I think it's very important that, you know, health tech companies be at, at, at these tables where decisions are being made. Um, so, for example, now the Lagos state government has a, a e-health strategy um, and we are being you know, consulted to, to help shape that. So, um, yeah, I think. Um, it definitely everybody's learning and there's no kind of set guidelines but I, i'm i'm hopeful that you know we'll have guidelines that work with work for everyone and um encourage innovation uh, yeah last comment as i can read if you can scroll up uh you're saying 100 percent survival rate is absolutely incredible well done oh yes um i wish we can maintain that um, thank you so much. I recognize so many health leaders from all over the world who've joined us. We had over 150 participants. Parting short, let me begin with uh, Caitlin, then I'll go to Ifeloa, and then KP, then Shigeru, and then finally Hiroki. Just your parting shot, and then we will close up there. Yeah, thank Caitlin. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for the webinar. I think that the, one of the points made um, really struck home to me is that partnerships are everything in healthcare. And so I look forward to partnering with many of you, whether it's the panelists or anyone else on this call. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Ifalua? Yeah, similar to Caitlin, I'm, I'm, I look forward to partnering with people and learning more about um, everyone's business. And I also, I'm very excited, you know, like it is a dark time for the world and the continent, but um, things are springing up that give us hope and uh, yeah, excited for the future and how we can shape healthcare and, you know, um, make health access a reality for, for everyone on the continent. Let's do that, KP. Great. I mean, like like my colleagues have mentioned, partnerships are key, and, and particularly in responding to something like COVID. And what I'd also say from a tech innovation perspective is there's some discussions at the WHO about, for example, pre-registering tech companies or setting guidelines that kind of create a bit more um, accountability in the space because there's so many actors. What I would say is that, you know, our view is creating standards that tech innovators can work within is very important. Um, but I think that to make uh, companies pre-register to be able to do work is probably not the right direction. I um, mean, particularly in this context, I'd like to end with that. Thank you. Um, Shigeru, over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much. And as we all mentioned that the partnership is a key. And the, uh, from the uh, investment uh, point of view, we would like to uh, connect the dots to make the, to encourage more, syner more synergies among the uh, portfolio companies so that uh, we can bring more digital health to the people's hand. Thank you. Let me ask Nishit to just say a few words before I move to Hiroki. Nishit, last words from you. Um, I think that this has been a great discussion and it's uh, you know nice to see that everybody's focus on partnerships is really increasing and moving away from you know, the silo movements. Um, the engagement in the wider stakeholder system and getting public health institutions and uh, you know, high level officials to sort of engage more into sustainable partnerships is, is uh, very key for the digital uh, landscape to scale up. Excellent. Thank you. Hiroki. Yeah. Thank All the way again. from Japan. Last words. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks again for joining this opportunity. And since 2017, I had a lot of meetings with entrepreneurs, especially in tech sector. And uh, most of them are struggling to change people's behavior, how they can adopt the, this new technology. Uh, but now, uh, because COVID-19, they say it's a good opportunity uh, to change their way to provide healthcare services. And then after this, as I believe we can have robust healthcare systems uh, so that not just 
tackling the COVID-19, but also we can provide a good healthcare services to other diseases. Thank you very much. You guys have been a wonderful panel. It's such a diverse panel and so rich in information in digital technology. I see at least 100 people still logged in despite the 15 minute delay. That shows the amount of knowledge we've been able to share and the value of these partnerships. And I think together we'll be stronger in dealing with this pandemic. Let's keep on working with a unified front, one continent, one Africa, better health for all. See you now. Bye for now. Thank you for your time. Bye.